Okay, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, quite a high level uh, thing compared to most of the talks, uh, at least at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to talk about automating science using robot scientists. And then at the towards the end of the talk, I'm going to have a few ideas about machine learning. Okay, so traditionally uh, within AI, the application of AI to science is called scientific discovery. And uh, AI systems have uh, superhuman scientific powers. You know, they can flawlessly remember vast numbers of facts. They can execute uh, flawless logical reasoning. Uh, they can execute near optimal probabilistic reasoning. Uh, uh, they can learn uh, from vast amounts of data which no human can encompass. They can uh, learn uh, better from small amounts of data. They can extract information from millions of scientific papers, etc. So they have these uh, superhuman powers which we should use to help us to do science. And uh, I would argue that science is a wonderful application for AI. Uh, are are abstract, uh, like like games, chess, and Go, etc. You know, so that simplifies the problem. Uh, but they also involve the real world, which is a very interesting complication. Uh, and scientific problems are restricted in scope. So to, uh, to be a top scientist, you don't need to, and this is empirically the case, you don't need to know about lots of things in the real world. You, know, you don't need to be able to know about politics, art, literature, uh, how to cross the road, uh, all these things. Scientific problems are restricted in scope, and that simplifies it for the AI systems. Uh, so the, it says somewhere in Alice in Wonderland about talk about cabbages and kings and many things. So, for science, we don't need to, the AI system to know about many things, just about that area of science. Another advantage of science as an application area is that nature is honest. By this I mean if a human or a robot does a scientific experiment, we're, we're pretty convinced that the natural world is not trying to uh, fool us about the result of that experiment. Uh, we may misinterpret the meaning of the experiment, but we're pretty convinced that uh, there's Nature is not a hostile agent. It's not trying to lying to us. And that's quite different from many other types of problems. For instance, economic games. There's many uh, dishonest agents in, in the economy lying to you about what they're doing. And that makes it harder for the AI systems to figure out what's happening. But science is, is honest. And uh, also nature, I would argue, is a, a worthy object of our study. So uh, the world has got all these uh, problems. We have climate change, we have uh, food insecurity, uh, we have poverty, and what many of the brightest minds on the planet are doing is optimizing uh, algorithms for, for advertising. You know, sell, they want to sell us things that we don't really want, you know, and didn't really need. Uh, which is, I think, is a tragedy. Uh, and that's because uh, the Googles, the Amazons of the world, they're, they're paying top dollar f for people, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, and people go where the money is. And I would argue that the generation of scientific knowledge is a public good, at least if that knowledge is in the public domain. Okay, okay uh, the application of AI to science goes back a long time to, uh, at least until the 1960s and 70s, with uh, the dendral and metadendral projects. Uh, the application area here was, uh, mass spec chemistry, uh, and what they were interested in doing was analyzing uh, Martian soil. That was the, the target application. Uh, Mars is very far away, so they wanted to make the system automated to do that. Uh, so this is from the Viking uh, lander. Unfortunately, the AI system didn't actually fly on Viking because they didn't really have the technology to get it to work at that time. But they did... Uh, <coughs> Metadendral is actually one of the first ever machine learning programs, so they did a lot of very interesting uh, uh, AI development work. This was led by a guy called Joshua Lederberg. He got the Nobel Prize for Medicine, uh, but he was very interested in computer science. He taught himself to program back in the 1960s. He was very interested in uh, uh, the logical formalization of science. Uh, fascinating person. Uh, Ed Feigenbaum, he got the Turing Award for his work in expert systems. He was the main computer scientist in the project. Bruce Buchanan, one of the first ever machine learning people. And Carl Jurassi, I was the main chemist. Uh, and 
It's like Reggie Stark, he never got the Nobel Prize for, for chemistry, I think, uh, just because of, uh, who, you know who he is. Uh, does anyone else know who Carl Jurassic is? Uh, he was the, the father of the birth control pill and uh, transformed the world in many ways. But, uh, but uh, there was a lot of lobbying against him getting the Nobel Prize. And uh, Another landmark on AI in, in science was this Bacon project. Uh, this was led by Herbert Simon. They claimed to rediscover Kepler's laws of motion, which is a uh, bit, bit of a shaky claim because they really cleaned the data up pretty much before uh, giving the system uh, the, the, the data. So it just basically fitted, fitted curves to data. Uh, and Gepler did something much more difficult. But it was a very interesting project. It was, as I say, led by Herbert Simon, who is, I think, the only person to have won the Nobel Prize and the Turing Award. Uh, got his Nobel Prize for, for economics. So this is uh, what we say, proof by uh, reputation. You know, this is, AI and science is a very good thing, because all these smart people are, have done it. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so my contribution interest is these things called robot scientists. Uh, the idea is to make a computer robotic artifact which, in a sense, does scientific research. Uh, so you give the, the system some background knowledge about an area of science. That knowledge is represented using logic and probability theory because these are the two best ways we know to represent knowledge. There is, the system has an automated way of forming novel hypotheses about that area of science, essentially using machine learning of different types. The system has an automated way of selecting efficient experiments to discriminate between these hypotheses. And these experiments are efficient in terms of time and money because these are the two main limiting resources. You know, you want to get the answer first and you, you only have a limited budget. Then uh, the robot scientist programs a lab automation system to actually physically execute the experiments. The system looks at the results, modifies the probabilities of the hypotheses based on the results, decides on some new experiments, and repeats the cycle until there's only one consistent theory with the background knowledge and experimental results, or you run out of some resource. So that's the basic idea. We want to <coughs> sort of automate simple forms of scientific research. And why should we do this? Uh, my original motivation was uh, philosophical. I, I'm very interested in, uh, in science, what is science, and the idea is that if you can build uh, some artifact which people uh, agree, accept, does science, then you, we know something about what science is. You know? So it's an operational approach to the philosophy of science. And it's quite similar to one of the motivations for AI. If you want to understand the human mind, uh, neuroscientists will do one thing, but AI people try to understand the mind by building artifacts which are intelligent, and that feeds back into understanding the mind. And this is uh, Richard Feynman's uh, blackboard at the time of his death. You see, if you may be able to read here, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So it's the same operational approach to trying to understand something. Try to create it, and then if you can create it, then you understand it, arguably. The other motivation is uh, technological. Uh, we want to make science more cost effective and efficient. Uh, and robot scientists uh, can potentially work cheaper, faster, more accurately, and longer than human beings. You know, they can work 24 7. And they can also be more easily multiplied. It doesn't take, I don't know, 20, 25 years to grow another one. If we, if we have one working, we can make lots of them. So that's the motivation. Uh, Another increasingly important motivation is about the quality of, of science. So uh, in many areas of science, in biomedicine, uh, psychology, parts of chemistry, there is a reproducibility crisis in that uh, many of the published papers, uh, even in top journals, Nature and Science, uh, perhaps <laughs> estimates vary, but perhaps half, perhaps more of these papers cannot be reproduced in other labs. And that's not because the scientists are, are, are cheating or anything like that. It's just that the experiments are so complicated and so delicate that they haven't recorded in enough detail the conditions of the experiment. And the argument is that if a computer is doing the experiment, that it's recorded in much more detail. Uh, so there's a greater chance of reproducing it. And uh, at least what was done is more easily reproduced. <coughs> OK, 
again. I've been working on this uh, 20 years now. Uh, <coughs> our first work, uh, what we did there was basically we showed all the different steps uh, in that cycle could be automated. Uh, we had only very limited automation at the time. Uh, robots, I mean, very limited robots. But we could automate the different steps. And we showed the rediscovery of some known knowledge. Our robot scientist, Adam, uh, I was uh, fully automated the whole system and discovered some novel knowledge. Uh, we applied the same idea to, to Eve, uh, to tropical diseases. I'll talk about Adam and Eve. And uh, we're using Eve at the moment for systems biology. So this is a picture of Adam. It was uh, quite a big system from, a, from about here to the wall and about this wide. It's quite a big expensive system designed to automate uh, experiments in yeast. The application domain uh, was in biology, a uh, thing called uh, functional genomics. So uh, yeast is the organism which uh, is used to make uh, bread, wine, whiskey, uh, etc. But within biology, its application is as what's called a, a model system. It's the model eukaryotic cell. And humans are eukaryotic organisms. And it, it turns out that biology is incredibly conservative, so that even though the last common ancestor between yeast and humans was around about a billion years ago, uh, we estimate, most of what's true for yeast is also true for human cells. Uh, so once you've got biological systems work, they work the same way. And yeast is much easier to work on than human cells. It's gone only about 6,000 genes, human cells about 25,000 genes. Uh, they're very simple to grow, you just add sugar and a few salts. Uh, it's very easy to genetically manipulate. There's lots of experimental things you can do in that you can't do in human cells. Human cells are a delicate little things, they're very hard to grow. Okay, so yeast was sequenced uh, over 20 years ago in 1998, I think. Uh, the first eukaryotic organism to be sequenced, but to this day, uh, we don't know the function of about 20% of the genes in yeast. We really don't know what they do. Uh, so the function of genomics is about trying to understand the function of these genes. One approach to understanding these genes is to make uh, what are called latent mutants. So you take the gene you're interested, you remove it from the, the system, so, and then you look at what's, how the system works after that. And if anything is strange, then that will inform you about what that gene did. So it's a bit like trying to understand uh, the function of components in a car. You remove the steering wheel, you notice it's hard to, to steer, therefore you infer the steering wheel through steering. That's the, the logic the biologists use. It's, okay. uh, and there's this Eurofan project, uh, the collaborators involved. So basically what they did was made uh, all single deletant knockouts. So that's uh, 6,000 deletants, uh, 5,000 of them were viable, the, the system lived, so they made all of them. And you can get a library of these to do experiments on. Uh, there's a group in Canada, uh, Charlie Boone, he got money to do all double deletants, you know. Uh, and now he's working on all uh, triple deletants. <laughs> this this, this uh, scales exponentially. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so they've, we're working with the single deletant library. So, quick question, is, is it that, um, you made a car analogy, which is funny, but but um, is it really analogous in the following sense? The genes, so the genes work together in this gene regulatory network where they're constantly interacting. And it's kind of, it's, it's a recurrent neural network. It's, it's equivalent to a recurrent neural network. So it's, it's more like killing a neuron in a recurrent neural network, which is not an unreasonable thing to do, uh, unless the different genes are so different from each other. Yes, well, it's, it's about, oh, that's one of the fundamental problems is, is biology, and it's not well designed like a, in, in units which you could easily modify. And so it's, yes, there is a, it's, it's more difficult than a car. But of course, if you ever tried to figure out what's wrong with your car, you know, it's not always quite straightforward, you know, you to work backwards. Yeah, it's no, what I'm getting at is that the, the homogeneity between units in a recurrent neural network are equivalent to the homogeneity between different proteins different genes in our gene regulatory network might make it more meaningful to do such experiments than it would in a car, where each part is very specially designed for uh, Well, there, I think it's harder in, the, in yeast, because there's, there's redundancy, and uh, 
you may not notice any difference under certain conditions. Uh, the reason that we haven't figured these ones out is because uh, there's nothing really obviously wrong with the system. Uh, it probably has something to do with their ecology. You know, it's uh, the natural environment of yeast is not uh, wine. Actually, it's probably living on tree tree bark uh, sap. We don't actually know very much about yeast in the wild. Okay, we to, for we to formalize everything. Uh, so we use logic program to represent the background knowledge. Uh, we used abduction to infer new hypotheses. We used active learning to decide on efficient experiments. And uh, I'll describe these in a bit more detail soon. Uh, one thing uh, which is missing from the philosophy of science, actually, is that if you're actually in a real lab and uh, you do an experiment, it's not always obvious what that experiment means compared to your hypotheses. That it's not always uh, clear cut. And the philosophy of science, always seem, they always assume that the user experiment is obvious what that experiment means. That's not the case in reality. So we had to do quite a lot of work on machine learning to actually clarify the meaning of experiments. OK, the background knowledge. Uh, this was done. Uh, we wanted to model what's called metabolism. Metabolism is how a yeast uh, converts its food, basically sugar and salts, into all the uh, chemicals it needs, or the metabolites it needs to, to grow. These are amino acids, uh, nucleotides, etc. Okay, And we needed to abstract this so that we could reason about it. Uh, we abstract it as a, as a large uh, labeled directed hypergraph. So the metabolites are the nodes, and the enzymes are the arcs on that graph. So this is abstraction of metabolism. And we needed to relate this abstraction to what was observed in reality. And you do that through this idea of a uh, path through the graph. So if a path could be found from the starting points, that's the sugar and the salts, to all the endpoints that were necessary, then uh, the cell would grow. And that's how you relate it. And that can be observed empirically in the lab by the robot. So these are how it relate the model to reality. How are you modeling cases where multiple enzymes are needed to produce a given metabolite? Is it different? That's why it's uh, it hypergraph. Yeah, so it's so every arc is needed in order yeah. to produce that? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, just one arc is needed, one of the multiple ones. Yeah. Right, but sometimes you can have things where multiple enzymes are needed to produce Yes, yeah, so we also, that was another complication, yes. Uh, uh, and we sort of tweaked the. Uh, the, the, prog the program to allow that to be the case. Yeah. So I think there's, in this somewhere, uh, uh, I think it was somewhere over here, that, that was the case. I can't, uh, I can't remember the detail, but there was a case both where you need, so here there's, there's two ends. So the things in blue are the genes encoding enzymes. So here there's what's uh, what are called isoenzymes, or two enzymes calculating the, uh, on the same actual uh, function. Uh, in reality, they may have slightly different functions and do slightly different things. Uh, but there was also a case where, uh, I think maybe this is the one where there was the more complications. But because we're using uh, basic logic programming, we can add arbitrary complexions to the model. Uh, so this is a little bit of the this large model of metabolism. Uh, so the idea, if you can go from here, this is one starting point, to these three endpoints. Uh, these are the aromatic amino acids. Every living creature has to either eat these, which is what we do normally, or synthesize them, which yeast does, yeah, from sugars. So if you can't get to these three endpoints, the system won't grow, and then you can observe that. Yeah. Hypothesis formation. Uh, so in science, it's uh, at least the philosophy of science, they argue that science is based around type forming hypotheses and deducing the experimental consequences of these uh, hypotheses. So you f form a hypothesis in some way, then you deduce what you expect experimentally from that hypothesis. Uh, in uh, the philosophy of science, you know, it's supposed to be the hard part is forming the hypotheses, you know, the eureka moments of Archimedes in the bath, etc. In biology, most hypothesis formation is abductive, not inductive. Uh, and I'll explain what that means in the next slide. So Adam used abductive inference to infer missing arcs and labels in the me metabolic graph. Okay. Once these uh, were in place, then it could infer deductively what it expected to see experimentally. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try to explain what these, these terms are. You know, not uh, everyone knows. Uh, 
So deduction, this is classical logic. This is what uh, Aristotle uh, claimed to have invented 2,400 years ago. Uh, it's the basis of uh, mathematics. You know, you have a set of axioms and you infer deductively uh, new theorems. Computer science is essentially, you know, computer program runs are essentially doing deduction. So here's an example. You have all swans are white. You have a fact that Daffy is a swan, then you can infer deductively that Daffy is white. Okay. And the beautiful thing about deduction is that if the rule and the fact are true, you only infer new truths, which is a beautiful uh, uh, property, but it's insufficient, deduction is insufficient to do science. We have to have some way of generating new ideas. One such way is uh, abduction. Uh, I'll give you an example here. So you have a rule all swans are white. You have a fact that Daffy is white. Then you infer abductively that Daffy is a swan. Okay. Uh, and the thing to note here, that is not necessarily uh, true, you know. Uh, uh, Daffy's, see, Daffy's a duck, yeah. But uh, it is one possible hypothesis which you can experimentally test as a way of generating new ideas. Uh, I had a, an article uh, in Scientific American, and I wanted to use this example of Daffy and tweeting things, and they said, no, no, <laughs> that's uh, intellectual property of Warner Brothers. You're not allowed to use that, you know. The, and I'm probably in breach of that now, you know. Uh, uh, has anyone here read uh, Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yeah? uh, oh. Not so many of the younger people. It's, I think <laughs> you should read Sherlock Holmes. He is it's very entertaining, but he's, uh, Sherlock Holmes is often say, he often uh, says, I deduced, you know, that the, uh, uh, the murderer was the, the butler because of the footprints in the library and other sort of clues. He's technically incorrect there. That, that's an abduction. You know, he's, abdu he's abduced a single fact based on these different pieces of evidence. So once that fact's in place, then you can deduce the footprints in the library and things like that. But the actual generation of the hypothesis, that's abduction. You can tell it's an abduction because there's other possible explanations. It's not necessarily true. Okay. Uh, the other way of forming novel ideas is induction. Uh, this is the, the basis of machine learning. Uh, most machine learning. So you find Daffy is a swan in white, Tweety is a swan in white, then you infer using your machine learning program that all swans are white. Okay? Uh, and of course, uh, this is also our machine learning programs are, are prone to error as well. You know, it's uh, when uh, the example of swans are white, uh, all swans are white, goes back to Aristotle. And it was taught in uh, European universities uh, for a thousand years during. Uh, but it's, you know, when people got to uh, Australia, they found that swans are black there. Yes, so uh, the basis of why we should believe our machine learning programs or the generalization is, is still a tricky one in philosophy. Uh, the philosopher David Hume, a uh, Scottish philosopher, he pointed out in the 18th century that the only reason that we believe uh, in induction is that uh, it works, which is itself an induction. You know, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, I, Sometimes I worry about, you know, why, I think it was with Laplace who estimated that you know, he thought the world is 6,000 years old and used the sort of basic uh, Bayesian reasoning to work out the probability of <laughs> the sun rising tomorrow. You know, it's, uh, we know that, <laughs> that you can make some sort of uh, Bayesian argument for induction, but it's, it's a difficult one. Okay, experiment selection, uh, inferring efficient experiments. Uh, we wanted uh, uh, efficient experiments in time and money. Uh, we assumed a Bayesian f uh, setting, associated costs with different hypotheses. Uh, sorry, it's the Bayesian uh, assumption here. Uh, I mean, associated costs with experiments. These costs were the real cost of, uh, of the wet experiments, because we were using different metabolites to, to do the experiments. So essentially, we're adding metabolites to the growth media and seeing what happens. And these varied by orders of magnitude. So it makes sense to choose efficient experiments. And for this problem, we argued that the optimal thing to do was to choose a series of experiments which minimize the expected cost of eliminating all but one hypothesis. Okay. Uh, so it's a bit of a closed world here, so we could actually do this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, this Russian mathematician Fedorov showed uh, in the 70s. This is uh, intractable. It's NP. It's actually the NP hard problem. I don't know why I got complete there. Uh, 
And, but you can model this program onto it's the same problem as basically finding uh, the smallest uh, uh, decision tree. And we know from uh, from practice and from theory that we can find near optimal decision trees in polynomial time. Uh, and we showed this. Uh, let's actually show some a bit more. We uh, we developed this recurrence formula to try to estimate this uh, and. We used this, what we call the ACE strategy, and we showed that this outperforms uh, random experiments, and uh, it also outperforms uh, choosing the cheapest experiment at each point, which is what we call naive here. Okay, so that's uh, accuracy versus time, and accuracy versus money. So it's, it pays to think carefully about what experiments you do next. We program these using the, the diagram of Adam. And uh, Adam generated confirmed uh, novel functional genomics hypotheses about the density of genes encoding enzymes, catalyzing what are called orphan enzyme reactions in the metabolic pathway of yeast. That's its claim to fame. So orphan uh, reactions are ones where it's about the, we know that this particular chemical reaction is there, this enzymic reaction but we don't know what gene encodes it. Uh, and uh, Adam figured out this case for, for 12 of them. Uh, and then we went into the lab and manually confirmed these. So we did a gold standard experiments. Uh, you uh, take the gene out, so you make the gene product uh, and show it has the enzymic uh, properties Adam predicted. Okay. So we claim that Adam was the first machine to autonomously discover novel scientific knowledge. By that we mean it has to hypothesize the knowledge and then experimentally confirm the hypothesis. These are uh, a list of the uh, knowledge confirmed. Okay, so that was Adam. Our new, our, our later robot scientist called Eve. The idea behind Eve was to apply the same idea but to something of more uh, direct societal importance, which is drug design. In particular, we're looking at uh, neglected tropical diseases, uh, malaria uh, infects hundreds of millions of people uh, a year, kills uh, half a million to a million people, mostly babies in Africa. Uh, I was in uh, Nigeria this year and uh, I was asking people, have you, have you had malaria? And they said, of course, I get it every year. You know, it's like, uh, it's like the flu. You know, it's, so it's not just killing people. It's like a uh, huge burden on society, this disease. You know, it's, it's terrible. Uh, it, and uh, it could come back here. You know, I don't, maybe there's not enough uh, in California, not much rain here. But it killed quite a few people, quite a few English kings uh, in Britain uh, from malaria. Uh, it's it was called the ague. If you read Shakespeare, loads of people get the ague, and that's this malaria used to be very common in Europe. Uh, uh, schistosomiasis uh, infects maybe a quarter of a billion people, kills 50,000 roughly. Leishmania kills about 50,000 people and disfigures many, many more. Chagas disease, roughly with the same number of deaths. It's this horrible assassin bug which you get in uh, Latin America. It's probably what Darwin suffered from. Okay, uh, so as I say, these are huge problems of the world. They're called neglected uh, because the pharmaceutical industry is uh, not really interested in treating them. It, it's quite shocking, really, and uh, in many ways disgusting that, uh, that because these people are poor, there is no money to, to well, there's no money to develop drugs to treat them. Uh, and I think actually the pharmaceutical industry is uh, making a mistake here because they, they're only looking at one side of the problem. Uh, these diseases are actually quite simple for them to actually develop drugs for because we know the, uh, the causation of these diseases. You know, for, for many diseases like, uh, oh, say diabetes type 2, which was a huge problem in the world, uh, we know that it's something to do with sugar imbalance in the body, but how on earth to treat it with a single uh, molecule is far from clear. Uh, or cancer, we know the cause of cancer, you know, but the problem there is that uh, that cancer is basically you, you know, and there's only diverged maybe a a year ago or something, whereas these diseases, the organism, they diverged a billion years ago or something. So it's easy to find biological differences between them. And then what you need to do is to treat these diseases, 
just kill the parasite. It's very straightforward. Uh, so I think that the irony of all this is that the pharmaceuticals they could treat these much easier than the ones, the diseases they're looking at, but they don't. Uh, so we wanted to automate this problem. So we use standard chemoinformatic methods to represent the background knowledge. Uh, we used machine learning, induction, a uh, thing called quantitative structure activity relationships, you know, just little models which you put a chemical structure and you predict the activity. We've heard a lot about that t in this week. Uh, and we used active learning, well, active learning and active learning. So, I mean, active learning and optimization to uh, decide efficient experiments. So, most traditional active learning, you just, you're choosing examples to shrink the variance. Here, we want to also optimize at the same time. So, we had to combine these two things. You know, we don't care about how good we're predicting low activity compounds, we only want to predict the high activity ones. So, that balances the exploration and exploitation. Uh, as we've heard a couple of times this week, you know, how it's traditional approach in drug design is you, uh, you have a large library, maybe a few million compounds, you have a big robot which goes through these mil million compounds and tests them on what's called an assay, which is a cheap uh, test to see how well that compound works. Once you've done that, uh, you stop uh, and then you go back and retest all the, the hits. These are the positive compounds because most of these are false positives because the, the class imbalance. And once you've done that, then you do these cycles of improving the molecule, uh, testing it out, improving it. And each cycle will take several weeks to do because you have to get the chemist to make the compound because uh, we don't quite have these uh, synthetic robots yet. Uh, what we wanted to do was automate these three steps and we're not going to make any new compounds, we're just going to once we've started going through the library, we're going to, once we've got a few hits, we're going to start the machine learning at that point. So we're going to retest them to make sure they're real compound or real hits, and then use the machine learning to choose compounds from the library. Okay, instead of going through the whole library and then doing the machine learning, we start, as soon as we find enough hits, we go through the light, we choose compounds from the library uh, based on the machine learning. We used uh, this new robot called Eve. Uh, the clever is it's about the same size as Adam. <coughs> the cleverest thing is this acoustic liquid handlers. They use sound waves to ping tiny droplets of uh, the drugs, or potential drugs. So it, each droplet is 2.5 nanoliters. So if you want 10 nanoliters, you have four droplets pinged. It's by far and away the most accurate uh, way of moving small amounts of liquid around. Let's see if we can get the robot to. So the robots are moving, uh, they're basically uh, scaled down versions of the robots used to build uh, cars and things. They don't have many sensors, but they're very uh, accurate in their movement. What it's picking up here is what's called a 384 well plate. It's, uh, it's about this size, it's a uh, micro titer plate made from plastic, got 384 little wells which you can do experiments in. And this is the, the target plate where we, we're going to do the experiments in this, there's nothing into the moment. It's going to go into this liquid handler, this acoustic liquid handler, and go upside down and the little drop is going to be pinged onto it and they'll stick because of surface tension. So now uh, Eve has decided to do some experiments. It's, it's selecting uh, particular compounds from its library to test on, in the wet assay. So this is uh, what's the library plate. It's got different compounds. It's selecting individually which experiments it wants to do.
Okay, so this is the plate which has the, uh, the compounds in it which we want. And what's happening here is we're adding the, uh, the assay, essentially. And the, for the assay, we would developed uh, some synthetic biology to make separate yeast strains which resemble yeast in human uh, cells. So it's a cheap and uh, informative assay. This is what's called no, another type of liquid handling robot. And the readout from this assay is just how, how well this compound works uh, about killing uh, malaria cells compared to human cells. And we have uh, yeast analogs of these two systems. This is a blood, a blood stage parasite? Uh, so, uh, it's, we're looking at a, it's a targeted assay. Uh, so we're using yeast as the assay system. We've remi what we do is we take out uh, an enzyme, say DHFR, from, uh, from, from yeast. So it's targeted and it's in a living system. So uh, we sh that shows that at least the compounds can get through membranes. Uh, uh, they're not cytotoxic. Uh, which is the problem if you have most targeted uh, assays. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry isn't impressed by these assays. No, they <laughs> I, well, I think they're very clever. OK. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to show that uh, this, uh, this approach to uh, finding uh, initial compounds is more cost effective than what's traditionally done in, the, in industry. Uh, so we costed everything uh, and built a little econometric model of the different costs in sequencing, uh, sorry, in, uh, in screening. And the conclusion is for most areas, uh, for most reasonable costs, this blue, greeny part, it makes sense to uh, do the intelligent screening rather than the brute force screening. Uh, of course, if you don't miss anything, you need to screen everything. Uh, that's the part here. And this scale, what's kind of scale of reduction here? Is it? Uh, I can't see what's. Yeah, I I'm not. I have to check what exactly that utility scale is. But it, it makes quite a lot of difference. It's uh, so it's been adop adopted by uh, big pharma when they because they have quite fast picking robots now. So uh, it may, it is a. <laughs> In most cases, cost-effective to actually put a bit of intelligence into the screening system. Uh, I'd have to check on the actual details. And the most interesting thing we found was this compound called triclosan. Uh, it's, uh, it, I'm pretty sure you've all swallowed quite a lot of this because it used to be in Colgate toothpaste. Uh, used to, oh, it's in baby soaps. It's, uh, uh, what we discovered, actually, was it's it works against malaria, and we've, which was actually known in the literature when we looked, but we found out how it works. It's a target of DHFR, which is this classic drug design target. Yeah. And it works against uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is the main type of malaria in Africa, and Virax, which is the most common in other parts of the world. OK, I wanted to uh, sort of change uh, direction now, and because uh, I've been listening to all these talks about uh, uh, you know, networks and drug design, and, uh, and I wanted to uh, first discuss an old idea about how to do this and, and a new idea, which are quite different. Uh, uh, and I, you know, i have old enough to have seen, uh, this is the second hype cycle for neural networks I've been, I've lived through, or I'm living through. Uh, uh, the history of AI, there was one in the 40s and one in the 60s as well. Uh, there are other types of learning. Uh, and for the young people here, you know, if you, you know, you have to think, how are you going to make a success of your career? And just following a big bandwagon is not necessarily going to make you uh, stand out from the crowd. You know, and it's very competitive. You know, uh, might be an idea to look at, well, like some old ideas. Maybe they're not such bad ideas. You know, uh, 10 years ago, neural networks were in the wilderness. You know, people, uh, f you couldn't get money to study them. Uh, but now they're hot. You know, you need to. And it wasn't because neural networks were proved to be bad. It's just they were unfashionable. So relational learning is an unfashionable idea. No, it's an old. <laughs> uh, so almost all machine learning uses uh, two poles of attributes to 
uh, represent examples. So you know that's why you you have uh, sometimes called vectors or descriptors. You know you put up your descriptors in uh, uh, in this sort of structure, and essentially that's propositional logic. Uh, there is uh, richer forms of logic. Uh, the first order of predicate logic in particular, uh, you can use that to do learning as well. You know, it's, uh, as a computer scientist here, you may have studied this as part of your course. Uh, it's not fashionable now to use this for learning. Uh, uh, the reason it went out of fashion was because it was uh, considered too inefficient. Uh, I bet the neural networks have moved the bar there. You know? <laughs> in fact, I remember back in the in the late uh, 80s, I think it was, yeah, so the neural networks was coming down. We could not believe how much computing power these neural network people were prepared to throw at a problem. You know, this was a complete revelation to us, you know, how much computing power. And that's the same now, actually. I, do, and I look at the CPU power used to do neural network research. It's amazing. You know, and I think, what? Well, maybe there's other ways of using that power which are uh, uh, effective as well. Uh, okay, first order predicate logic. It's uh, Frege and Bertrand Russell uh, developed over 100 years ago to represent the structure of, math of mathematics. You know, it's the foundation of mathematics, represent the structure of it. Uh, propositional logic is much simpler. It's just basically to consider the world of facts. In first order predicate logic, you have objects, uh, you have relations between these objects, and you have functions, you have uh, exists, uh, all of these sort of things. So you can say, uh, much more complicated things. You know, you can say most things which are in natural language using first order predicate logic. You can express most of the mathematics, not everything, but most things. Okay. So the idea is to use this as a language for, for machine learning. Uh, yes, an attribute, so in propositional logic, and a lot of uh, the, the problems you're having representing chemical structure uh, is, and the symmetries and all these sort of things uh, is down to the fact you're using propositional logic as the uh, representational language. So a proposition, a descriptor of a molecule, you, you're being forced to saying something true for the whole object. Uh, that's essentially what you're doing. Uh, whereas a, a molecule has relationships between atoms and bonds and stuff. Uh, it's much more natural and it's much more closer to how a human being, chemist, thinks about molecules is to use a richer language. And tradition, and for most machine learning, you have to basically put everything into a table. You know, you have Examples are traditionally the, the rows and the descriptors, the columns. You know, that's the input to the learning. And that's very restrictive. Uh, so I think it's difficult to represent arbitrary chemical structure using propositions. Uh, I think you can prove that it's either the table grows exponentially or you, you must compromise somewhere on the, the fidelity of the structure of the molecules. And what, and what should the attributes be? And you, use all these different representations, and, but you're still struggling, I think, too, because of this restricted in the language. Uh, so relational languages uh, uh, enables abstract structure. You can put abstract, uh, arbitrary background knowledge, because essentially you're using computer programs as the representation language. Uh, so that you can uh, have arbitrary complex pieces of prior knowledge. Uh, to repeat to myself here. Uh, okay, here's one way, a very simple way to represent chemical structure. You know, uh, going to use uh, two predicates. One predicate is called atom. Here it says uh, so atom uh, in uh, molecule 127. There's a there's an atom number one. It's a carbon. It's got a, it's got type 22, and it's got a partial charge of 0 0.191. Okay, that's uh, just a f you're representing a a fact about the world. Uh, here's uh, another predicate. The other predicate you need, a bond. This relates two atoms together. So it says in molecule N27, there is a bond of uh, type two of type seven between uh, atom one and atom six. Okay. Uh, so using these atom bonds, you can represent uh, arbitrary chemical structures, almost at least the organic structures. Uh, you can put in a higher level knowledge. This is a definition of a methyl group. Uh, it just relates the hydrogens and the, the carbon and the bonding pattern. So once you put this into the background knowledge, the system knows about a methyl group and it can use the methyl group in its learning rather than just uh, the individual carbons and hydrogens. Uh, 
very simple to extend this to 3D. You just uh, add coordinate positions. Uh, they don't have to be an, all aligned to the same coordinate frame. They just have to be uh, just coordinate positions. And then add background knowledge of Pythagoras' theorem. And that allows you to relate the uh, distances between all the objects. If you want multiple confirmations, you just label each confirmation and add that as well. It's, it's, it's a trivial extension. And you can also extend it to more interesting quantum mechanical things. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the collaborator Bjorn Alsberg, who unfortunately died a few years ago, who's a theoretical computer science uh, chemist, to me, uh, he was very interested in Bader's theory and atoms and molecules, and using these critical points in the representation as well. Okay, so that's an old idea, which I think uh, has still some work in it. So you know, here's the adding uh, ideas from quantum mechanics into the same framework. So I. I would argue that molecules are relations uh, rather than just uh, propositional type representation. The other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is this new, I new idea we're calling transformational learning. Uh, so the, the new idea we argue is to, uh, if you want, so uh, I think Al Alan said that machine learning is all about representation and that's the, a good representation is the secret of everything. And, uh, so there's the idea is to represent an object by what other models, uh, machine learning models, say about that object. You know, or train for different problems, and uh, this can produce better accuracy, and you can get some insights into it. So, so this is standard machine learning. You want to make uh, uh, you're doing some uh, learning about models, uh, about animals. So you have uh, you learn a model for a, a donkey. Uh, one for a kitten and one for a rabbit, you know, uh, using uh, these descriptors, these pro size, ears, cuteness, etc. I, I know it's not true that donkeys really are quite cute. I should have really had <laughs> yes there. So that's the standard way. You build separate models based on these basic, uh, the, what we call intrinsic descriptors of the object. Okay, it's size, it's ears, etc. And then transformational learning, uh, the idea is that uh, if you want to build models about donkeys, you first you ask the rabbit model what it thinks about a donkey, and you ask the kitten model, and then you do the learning on this transformed representation. Okay, uh, and you do similar things here. Okay, and the the idea, the intuition why this should work is oh, okay. So this this model's uh, quite easily over to uh, drug design. So you have a particular drug design problem. The traditional approach is you have descriptors, uh, like a fingerprint of the molecules, and you do learn the model. In uh, the transform case, you, you built all these different models, uh, and then you do the learning on how well it's, this particular compound is predicted to be, say, a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, or how well it's predicted to be a kinase type 2 inhibitor. And then use that transformed uh, uh, representation to do the learning about how good the compound it is. Uh, so the intuition is that uh, it combines ideas for multitask learning. So multitask learning is when you have a whole bunch of problems you want to learn at the same time. Uh, and transfer learning is where you transfer ideas from one model to another model. Okay? Uh, so instead of using a predefined similarity measure to, to select similar tasks, we project the different tasks into this sort of new representation. Uh, then use meta-learning, so it's learning about learning, to learn this, uh, how to make accurate predictions for the, for the base task. Uh, I've done quite a lot of work on this recently, so we... So this doesn't depend on any particular type of learning method, you know, you can use random forests, neural networks, uh, etc. Because what it's doing, it's like a, a meta-learning idea. Uh, it needs to be a non-linear learning method, but that's the only restriction. Uh, we have three big problems. We used, uh, this is Kemble database. Uh, it's got, uh, in our version of it, we have around about 2,000, so, yeah? So are you using the, the, the raw probability output from those classification models? Well, we're, this is actually, uh, we're normally working in the aggression framework, so each one's producing a number, you know, it's like, uh, 
it's a bit hard to explain with donkeys and uh, regression. Uh, that's, that's, but yeah, it's basically mostly regression. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for in Campbell, we have roughly 2,000 separate problems we want to learn about. Uh, in Lynx, there's about 1,000 problems about predicting gene expression. And uh, in meta learning, the problem is to predict uh, which learning algorithm should I use for this particular problem. Uh, for drug design, uh, why uh, there's a problem here for deep learning and is that most of the, most of these problems have quite a limited number of examples. You know, there's only maybe a hundred, or if you're lucky, some of them a lot less than a hundred examples. Maybe there's a few thousand at most. So there's a, a real problem if you want to use uh, deep learning on these problems, unless you want to try to bundle everything together. And I would suggest that uh, transformative learning is a, bit, a better approach in that case. Uh, uh, yeah, so it basically it works in many cases. For the, for the QSAR, uh, we've done a lot of work with other types of machine learning and other representations, so 10% improvement is quite good there. Uh, we still haven't got these results because the neural network's really slow. It's taking uh, literally months of time to, uh, to do this, to do it properly. Uh, because if you use a single architecture for, uh, for all the problems, you're going to do very badly because they, they vary greatly in size. Uh, so th if it's a big problem, you want to use a clever uh, architecture, but for the small data sets, a big architecture is not going to work. So you have to play around with the architectures, etc. OK, to finish off, uh, so in, uh, in chess and go, there's this cont cont continuum of ability from novices up to grandmasters. And I, and I argue that that's the case in science as well, that there's, there's a continuum of ability at science from the very simple forms of science that Adam and Eve can do through the types of science that you and I can do up to the, the grand masters of science, sure, and Newtons and Einsteins, uh, Darwins, etc. And if you accept that, then I argue that uh, computers are going to get better at uh, doing science, uh, driven by better hardware, better software, just like they got better at playing chess and go, and eventually uh, they'll be as good as human scientists and maybe even better. Uh, so 10 years ago, the, Frank, the physics Nobel laureate Frank Wolchevich is on record as saying that in 100 years' time, the best physicist will be a machine. Uh, we shall see. Uh, so my vision for the future is this, uh, this collaboration between human and robot scientists will produce better science than either can alone. Uh, I'm not, so uh, in chess, for instance, uh, until at least, I'm not sure what the current state is, but until very recently, humans plus computers were better than computers alone. Even though uh, uh, computers got better than the, be uh, you know, uh, Kasparov got beaten 20 years ago by a, a computer for the first time, and my, my phone could easily beat uh, the world champion at chess now. Uh, but still, humans plus computers were better than computers alone because there are certain positions that computers don't understand well. So I think that humans and computers working together in science will better than either alone. Uh, I, I didn't talk about this, but I think using natural language to express science is a, a very bad idea. We should use uh, uh, logic. Uh, this was, uh, it, logic is uh, semantically much clearer, and that's the, we want to make things clear in science. Uh, Natural languages are deliberately amb ambu ambiguous. They, uh, uh, they're designed to make I don't know, human beings fall in love with you, to ex express anger, things like that, which we don't need in science. Logic was designed to express things clearly. It was designed to make especially mathematics clear and also science. Uh, and this will lead to the pro better productivity of science uh, and benefits to society. Uh, to conclude, science is a wonderful application here for AI. Automation is increasingly important in science. Uh, I argue that the robot scientist is the next logical step in uh, scientific automation. Uh, Adam was the first machine to uh, discover some novel scientific knowledge. Uh, Eve has found some lead compounds for neglected tropical diseases. And yes, I would argue that robot scientists are needed for 20th century science. And so I'd like to thank all, all my collaborators in Manchester, in Aberystwyth, Cambridge, Bunnell, Leuven, and Thailand. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.